to Series 4 of the Understanding Boys podcast. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to leaders past, present and emerging. In this series, we're talking with amazing mums. We ask their tips, advice on how they raise their boys, all the while leading successful and diverse lives. As usual, we ask our questions of what is it to be a good man these days? And if you had a story that you could tell a 14-year-old boy and he'd listen, what would the story be? I'm Dr. Ray Swan, and we're a community of teachers and parents concerned with the education and growth of boys in the modern world. The series is brought to you by Bride and Grammar, an all-boys school based in Melbourne, Australia. In today's podcast, we speak with Genevieve Bramall. Genevieve is best known as National Head of PR and Talent Relations for News Corp Australia. Over the years, she's also worked on a number of advisory boards, including the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, the Melbourne Press Club Board, as well as supporting local sport and helping out at her children's schools. I really enjoyed speaking with Genevieve. I found it to be a very authentic and genuinely connected person to the work that she does and she says some amazing stories about her own life experience and what she's learned along the way. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. So welcome Genevieve Bramall to the Understanding Boys podcast. It's great to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Just off mic we were talking a little bit about parenting and for both of us a lack of you know expertise but certainly good intentions but look thank you very much for your time in advance I'm hoping to cover a few things with you today but I thought probably a good place as any to start is just a bit about you and your background and the work that you do um, just to give the the listeners a a bit of an insight I've had an amazing career you know at News Corps and also in public relations what does a day you know in the life of that look like for you? There are no two days the same uh, in, a, in a media uh, world, which is why I'm doing what I do. I started out in my early years studying a law degree at Melbourne University, and I very quickly realised that the law, while incredibly challenging and enriching and important, was also you know, a labour of love. You could be working on a case for months, if not years, on end. And for me, I'm probably a little bit too fickle for that. I need um, constant variety, constant change, um, constant fresh challenges, um, uh, the ability to meet new people all the time um, and, uh, and, to, and to think outside the square in different ways uh, every day. And that is what my job has delivered for me. So starting out as a journalist and then moving through into magazine publishing and then into um, you know, corporate affairs and public relations now nationally for News Corp and it is the kind of job where yeah as I said no two days are the same I effectively work to proactively and positively publicize the journalists and journalism um, of all of our brands across Australia so that's all of our newspaper brands uh, our magazine brands uh, like Vogue our online sites like kidsport or news.com.au yeah right through from you know newspapers like the NT News or the Geelong Advertiser, through to our, our mainstream metro markets like the Herald Sun or the Daily Telegraph. So it is very, very varied uh, work. And I uh, have been there now, uh, I'm into my 28th year with the company. So, um, yeah, I, I, I clearly enjoy what I do <laughs> to stay that long. It's huge. I mean, it's a huge role. It's a huge role for a number of reasons. One, obviously the scope, the number of, uh, you know, various... Um, you know, publications that you're putting out there and, and obviously the time you've spent in the role as well. But I think one of the other things that's quite extraordinary, I think, has been the changes to uh, news and how we consume news, you know, even the last sort of 10 or 15 years, um, you know, and obviously things like paywalls and, you know, some of the, the the brands that you work with, you know, how they manage access and advertising and also, um, I guess, you know, the the ways in which now there's, is there such a bad thing? Is, is there bad publicity anymore? Does that even happen? <laughs> Probably. Um, well, I would, I would argue that um, you get worried if you're not being talked about. So um, I love the diversity of 
content that we publish. I love that sometimes it's controversial and that not everybody agrees with every word that we that we write. Um, I think that in a really robust democratic society, there has to be room for multiple voices. Um, and you know, obviously through the work that I do, uh, we we make sure that that we are publicising content that is um, is going to be richly um, read and enjoyed by a wide variety of Australians. As the the audience that is consuming a News Corp publication each month is around 18 million Australians. So um, there is something for everyone um, uh, within the the brands that that we um, publish. And um, yeah, I, I'm really proud of the diversity of content that that is available to Australian audiences. If I was a parent listening and I was thinking, gee, it looks like an expansive area. You know, we're in a job market where we're seeing some contractions. You know, yesterday I was reading a paper that was looking at, um, you know, the the decline of certain roles in society. It was a Productivity Commission report, you know, that certain essentially replicable cognitive and even some emotional kinds of roles are just really starting to, even law, interestingly, um, is becoming, you know, th- with the advent of, AI and the new, you know, chat GPT and all these sorts of things that are sort of coming out. What, what would it, what, you know, if, and I guess in your day there would have been cadetships, I'm imagining, you know, it's a good yeah. place to start. What, you know, if I'm a parent, I'm listening, I'm thinking, gee, my, I reckon my kid might be interested in either PR or, or news or, you know, talking to people, interviewing journalism, finding things out. What, what's a good place to start? What would you be encouraging them to do? Oh, uh, look, I think that journalism... What storytelling more broadly um, is a skill um, and a necessity that isn't going to go away. So the platforms that we consume on might change and we might not now know what we might be consuming in five years' time. Five years ago, we probably didn't know that Netflix was going to be such a phenomenon. But people's desire to connect with other people and to connect through their stories, I think, is, is ageless. And so... I think there's always going to be scope for great journalism and um, how we how we navigate our way to that in the future is constantly evolving. Uh, News Corp last year partnered with Google to create the Google News Academy, um, which really is about training the next generation of journalists in storytelling methods that take us beyond the printed word or the written word on a, on a website and into new ways of working with drone technology or um, audio podcasting um, and, and, and other aspects. I haven't done the course, so I'm not intimately <laughs> so um, involved with what um, it, it actually offers, but it, it's just an example of, of how we have to constantly be on guard, um, be aware of um, how we can evolve to meet the needs of a changing audience um, and, and to ensure that we're telling stories in ways that um, are going to continue to be consumed. I think that you know we went from a, a place of uh, of long form journalism being, um, <clears throat> especially in you know big Saturday newspapers mm. and Sunday newspapers, people would spend hours poring over, um, you know, inserted magazines and and probably those days, um, you know, are, are really have really changed and and now people um, tend to snack on mm. more bite sized content um, more frequently, um, but that isn't to say that people don't then spend a lot of time. Um, consuming news, they just might do it in smaller chunks, or they might just decide for themselves to 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 binge a whole um, feature story mm. um, that is told in different ways. Um, I think I worked um, very very closely with Hedley Thomas of the Australian on the uh, the teachers' trial last year, right. um, and I think that the the work that the Australian did in that space on the Chris Dawson trial. Um, was profound, and um, our audience could consume that in multiple ways. It was uh, in newspaper format. It was on our website. There was um, a podcast, obviously, that uh, sort of took the world by storm. And um, you know that kind of storytelling and finding, you know, for, for a journalist of, of Headley's ilk uh, and mm. expertise and longevity in the industry, for him to find a new voice and a new way of telling stories. Um, you know, was was very very special, and and I think well, for those who've consumed both the Teachers Pet and the Teachers Trial podcast, um, you know, they've been really spoiled by that quality and excellence of um, of terrific journalism. Yeah, it's such a great observation, and I you know I wonder you know you're saying earlier about the importance of you know in a democracy of having you know news that's available, and then we also have you know the role of I guess media is a fourth estate and, you know, keeping everybody honest and, you know, holding up a, you know, holding up a mirror to what's going on. 
But yet at the same time we have, you know, we're telling stories and we're also, we're giving perspectives. You know, it's, it's amazing, isn't it, the power of contemporary media to still shape, uh, you know, community discourse. And also I guess there's an ethic and a morality that needs to be in and around that and the kinds of stories that we do and don't tell, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I've always felt enormously privileged to occupy the space that I do um, professionally because the access to people and to information and people's, you know, willingness to open up their hearts and tell their stories is is profoundly um, a privileged place. Um, but with that comes enormous responsibility. And um, and so I, I do agree with you. I, I feel that um, we need to make sure that we are telling stories all the time with the utmost respect and integrity that we can uh, to make sure that we're balanced, we're asking the right questions and, you know, when it's, a report that it remains a report and when it's an opinion it quite clearly is, yeah. you know can be as opinionated as you like <laughs> I, I love i love even within you know um the pages of all of our own newspapers that there will be journalists who literally probably can't look each other in the eye if they <laughs> if they walk past each other but there's a, a healthy debate that we're able to uh, facilitate absolutely i mean that, that that's really that is democracy isn't it and i it's funny i I often read the opinion writers with whom I disagree with most, actually, just to, <laughs> I don't know whether it's just a curiosity or a frustration, you know, I'll jump on and go, right, okay, what so-and-so said today about oh, I this think issue. Oh, <laughs> My pet hate is people who say to me, um, oh, I don't read the such and such. Um, right. I can't stand that kind of journalism. <laughs> okay. And I'm always intrigued as to how they know they can't stand it if they're not reading yeah, it. Yeah, if you don't read it. Um, mm. It's yeah. So, yeah, it's it's very true. And I mean, this is what I think, you know, in a good, healthy society, it's what, what we're after. And certainly, you know, the focus of this podcast around, un, you know, raising healthy boys for this age and, you know, that it's actually enabling them to grow into people who can debate and have robust discussions in a respectful way and that we don't just shut down when we people don't agree with us or that we, you know, or that we feel intimidated by other people's ideas or that conversely that we feel we need to, you know, just convince other people without actually you know listening you know we we're given two ears and one mouth for a good reason that sort of thing yeah absolutely well, look i think there's a real danger probably more so now than ever before that we our young people can exist in somewhat of a vacuum where they're only conversing with themselves um their mates they're on snapchat or whatever other yeah. app they're using and and they're um their opinions are being shaped um solely by those in their quite small world Mm. Um, and I think that when we were growing up, there was possibly just a greater awareness of a more broad church of view because we didn't all exist in those conversational silos. And um, yeah, so I think it's a, it's a it's an important point to just make sure that um, if it's not through a young person consuming different media themselves. Um, it's important to just continue the conversation to make sure that um, adult ideas and adult conversation is part of the world that your children exist in, that there's not a separate conversation had between mum and dad about some political issue, but perhaps um, it's had in the presence of young people to, mm. to at least ignite in them a desire to know more about whatever that is. Um, we talk extensively about the election in our house without necessarily even talking about who we were voting for, yeah, um, and that was both at a state and federal level, just to, um, you know, just to ensure that our children understand um, the incredible power that is um, bestowed on all of us as voters, but also to, to make them see that there is more than one side to every story, and and there's more than one opinion, and um, yeah, just to sort of challenge them to think about the world they live in beyond the front gate. Totally agree. I was lucky when I grew up as a kid. My mum would do that a lot. She'd often, you know, we'd have our dinner together and she'd pose a question, you know, if you were in this situation, what would you do? And it was often, uh, you know, an ethical question or something. It wasn't like overly, you know, didactic or prescriptive or, you know, she didn't do it every, 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 you know, every dinner or anything, but just every now and again, she just said, you know, I wonder if, you know, and I, years later she said, I said, did you, were you actually doing that on purpose? She said, yeah, I just thought it was really important that, it, you know, you actually think about some of these things about, you know, the roles and responsibilities that you have and, you know, some of the views that you have, have you really thought about them? Have you challenged them? Have you questioned them? And 
again, you know, it's probably a bit of an old-fashioned way to think about it and maybe a bit conservative, but the, just the old family dinner, you know, just trying to come together, if not once a day, at least, you know, once every couple of days, just to sit down and say, look, phone's away, let's have a meal together, let's have a chat, you know, and if there's silence for half of it, that's okay, but, like, let's just try and make that work because you pick up so much, I reckon, as oh, a kid. Completely. When I was growing up, I went to boarding school when I was 11, and so I missed the um, everyday um, nightly conversation with our, um, our parents. But what that meant was that when we got together in school holidays, we were all right. trying to save as much time together as possible. So yeah. sitting around our family dinner table was sometimes an hour's long event. Um, <laughs> and um, and I think probably before COVID, um, my, my kids were kind of largely in, you know, junior school, middle school um, prior to COVID. And uh, we got into a, into a routine of, of just ships passing in the night, lots of sports trainings after school, different routines, long days in the office. Um, I work a four-day week. My husband works, well, technically a seven-day week. He runs right. his own company. And so yeah. we were always um, busy. And COVID forced us to um, obviously take stock uh, and be here all together. Um, and some of the the joy, there wasn't much joy, but some of the joy that I got was um, in, in planning and preparing that family meal each night and for all of us to sit together and mm. talk because um, it, it was it was an opportunity that, you know, we really hadn't had before. Um, and so rather than constantly dwelling on the negative, I, was, I sort of saw an opportunity that, you know, exposed itself. And now um, because of some of the shifts that have happened um, so more broadly, uh, you know, in the workplace and, and our ability to work some of our time from home and some of the time now in the office, um, we're able to, to continue some of those habits now that we formed through COVID and maybe not every night, but but many nights a week we can still sit as a family and, and eat a meal together, which yeah, is something that's great. that really can't be underestimated. Yeah. I spoke, it's a little while ago now since I brought this up, but I've got a friend and she uses a process. Uh, she calls it, I think it's a two roses and a thorn or something. And so sometimes, you know, if we have, particularly when, um, you know, there's that phase, you know, for, it's a bit of a trope, I guess, but, you know, where the boys kind of get to that stage and they don't really talk much, you know, like it's kind of monosyllabic grunts and these sorts of things. But she uses a process. She's got three boys and, you know, she uses that process. And basically it's what's two, two good things that happen, one thing you found challenging today. And just a little hook like that, you know, it can seem a bit like, oh, really? But then you get, it just get, promotes the conversation and, you know, just gets things moving or you can ask an open-ended question that, you know, can promote conversations. I don't know if that's something that you guys have a process around that or whether it just kind you know, of flows. Well, we, we, we did at one point um, several years ago um, when, yeah, our, our son was struggling a little bit. A few incidents, you know, happened at school. Things weren't great. Uh, and he went off to just talk to a bit of a life coach. Um, yeah. We wanted him to be able to talk to someone independent about how he was feeling and, and he came home and he said, right, and so this is my son at the time, he was about 10, and he said, um, oh, you know, I want to start a new thing and I, every single night I want everyone to go around the table and, and just find three good things that happened today. Yay. To wow. be really honest, it is very hard some days as an adult to find three good things that happen in your day, yeah. especially if some days converge into other days and, yeah. you know, you've got a bit of Groundhog Day happening and, um, you know, we, we tend to sort of, talk about and, and dwell on the, the things that didn't go so well. Yeah. And then, and you don't realise the impact that can have more broadly on the young people in the world. So, you know, we, we did that for a long time. We probably should get back to it again. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't done it for a while. Well, sometimes these are the things, aren't they? They do. They You sort of hear it again and you realise. I mean, to me, that perennial thing, and it, it comes out a lot in the research that around, you know, actually taking gratitude as a way of sort of, you know, having those moments and going back to some of the things that really matter and some of the things that are working just kind of just gets that system sort of moving and, you know, what we choose to think about can change. And, you know, I, I really like your comment as well because sometimes as parents, you know, we do like, oh, you know, this thing happened and we don't really realise the wake, you know, the negative wake that washes over the kids and all kind of sitting there looking up, up at, you know, whoever's at home, whether it's, you know, traditional mum, dad or whatever family combinations, you know, that you don't realise always that the impact that that can have, you know, on them oh, and that so nervousness, true. yeah. I, uh, many years ago, there was a, a colleague of mine at work whose 
son actually was a Brighton Grammar student. He had a, a really bad accident, Will Murray, um, mm-hmm. and became a quadriplegic. And I didn't know his dad very well, but I did know a number of his colleagues. And I ended up on a on a sort of a committee, a fundraising committee to help the family in that immediate you know aftermath of Will's accident. And Emma Murray, his mum, was seriously the most incredible uh, woman I had ever met. She, um, her ability to find joy and mm. find light in that darkness and to find things to be grateful for at a time that was just so incredibly confronting and challenging for all of them. Um, you know, you, you, that's where you sort of sit down and think about your day and think about, oh God, imagine, just imagine if, if that were me. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I think I've, I, I definitely, the legacy of, of working so closely with that family had had a profound effect on me in terms yeah. of just finding joy. And I think also I've always been the kind of person that was a, a glass is half full. You know, I, I do tend to try to always look for the positive in, in any experience. But um yeah, I you know, I think I think that that is really, you know, an, an important life lesson. And certainly Emma <laughs> has continued to live that through her work as well. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. We spoke to her on this podcast, I think, um, I can't remember what season now, but yeah, an ima- amazing family and, you know, an amazing uh, story and, and really inspirational. And, and some of her practices now in high performance mindfulness, I know a number of schools, including Brighton Grammar, are using, um, using that that process about, you know, reframing, you know, what's my A game, what's my B game, what does that look like? Um, and really giving the, you know, giving kids the tools that they can actually do that. Because I guess we do... You know, we are a product of our environment. We do, you know, we we can, you know, we we all wake up sometimes in a bad mood or wrong side of the bed or you know. But having some tools, you know, and I guess when we were growing up, you kind of, I guess the day was programmed in such a way as you know, you go to after school sport and you you'd actually have to go for a run and you know you do your couple of laps and before you know you started doing ball drills or whatever and it would just force you to, you know, and there it is, you know, the example is physical exercise is a really great protective factor for, you know, feeling glum because you're actually moving your body around and, you know, it's all of those things. So yeah, it's an amazing story. I wanted to ask you a bit about your work in, you know, that you've just given one example of many examples where um, you've worked in service and, and community work, advisory boards, Murdoch Children's Research Institute, uh, fashion. I was pleased to, you know, and it mind a bit of fashion. So, I mean, there's a, there's a pretty broad, pretty broad range. You know, local sport. You know, you've done so much. I mean, you know, you have this huge job, family. Uh, you're doing all this extra stuff. I mean, the question I wanted to know was, you know, uh, uh, your thoughts around was why is that important to you? Like this, this sense of, connect, I mean, you've used the word connection a couple of times, and you know, I get the sense in which you're someone who is very good at, you know, finding ways and looking at, you know, building into people and, you know, creating relationships and positive outcomes. But, you know, to take someone who's already really, really busy, like all this work, extra work that you do, what's driving that? Oh, I think probably I am who I am as a product of my environment, like we all are. And my environment as a young person was very much influenced by, a family that sort of it walked the talk you know my my both my parents I was one of six children small country town a regional community uh, my father was a, a lawyer in the town um, my mother's father my grandfather was also a lawyer in the town and they were partners together and they never sat back and waited for someone else to put their hand up they always yeah. you know put their hand up first whether that was to be the coach the team manager the treasurer, the president, the board chair, whatever it was. And and so from a very young age, I just I just remember, you know, we'd say to mum, where's dad tonight? And, oh, dad's got a rotary meeting. Or yeah. we'd say to dad, where's mum? Oh, she's gone to the school, you know, school board meeting or the parish council meeting. And, and, and I'd watched my grandfather when I was three. He was elected to the, uh, as a senator in the federal parliament. And um, he was only a senator for about three years, but it, uh, you know, when you when you are influenced from such a young age by just literally witnessing the people around you give back and and be involved, um, like it is an expectation, it is very hard to not replicate that kind of behaviour. Yeah. And I haven't done it through necessarily necessarily um, through choice. It's it's more something that I've just um, 
it's found me. Um, and then as, as things have happened, I, I was on the Melbourne Press Club board for 10 years. And I felt like 10 years is quite a long time to give to an organisation that was largely, um, you know, professional, um, you know, um, work. So when I was coming to the end of that um, tenure, I decided to proactively seek out something to replace it mm -hmm. because I knew that if I didn't, the gap would close and I would feel like I had no time. But uh -huh. I had had time because I'd already been <laughs> devoting, you know, so much time to to that pursuit. And so I proactively sought out, I knew the Murdoch Children's was a, a great fit for me. Not only had it been founded by um dame elizabeth murdoch who you know was known to me personally um and uh, who's obviously whose family I, I work for but but more importantly that the the work of the murdoch is um is just so spectacular on a world scale um my son had been born with an immune deficiency um we describe that as he, he has no ninjas in his blood to fight germs and um <laughs> We discovered that when he was about two, and um, he was then a regular patient every six yeah. months at the hospital. So I I felt very compelled and drawn to the to the Murdoch, and um, I made a beeline for a person that I knew there and said I'd like to um, be considered for a role on their development board when one became available. And and it was pretty soon after that that I was able to transition out of one of those press club roles in, into the into the MCRI. And again, I've done that for the past 10 years. I did stand down off that board last year, um, largely because I did feel that um, as my kids have got older, ironically, I feel like they're, they're taking even more of my time. Right. Um, my job has become um, bigger as well as, as the years have gone on. And I do spend a lot of time in Sydney and I felt that um, I needed to, to claw back a little bit of time uh, for me. In saying that, I then have now put my hand up to be involved at both my daughter's school and my son's school in different um, <laughs> capacities for this year. So um, once again, I haven't let the, the grass grow um, under my feet. I've found other ways to, to give back that are, are meaningful to me right now and um, possibly won't take quite as much time as, as those um, board commitments. But um, yeah, as, as I said, my, my family, um, my, my, my dad and um, and my grandfather, all my brothers, my cousins, my uncles were all educated at Xavier. And um, Xavier as a, as a Jesuit school was founded on the principle or the Jesuit tradition um, uh, 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 and the philosophy that um, we should be men for others. Mm. Well, they now uh, have expanded that to be men and women for others. They have girls in the school now. And um, I love that philosophy. I think that, um, you know, we were always told as children and in, in, in raised in a Catholic um, primary school, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I, I still love that philosophy, but I do feel like it's it sends up a sense of, um, of a quid pro quo. That mm. in that equation, um, there's two people who must be doing things for each other. But being a man or a woman for others actually just says, uh, I'm doing this for no one other than someone else yeah, wow. and um and I, it, it, that to me is is um you know a pretty incredible um foundation um you know to to live by um so yeah i mean it's, it's my dad um i get emotional talking about my father um yeah is an incredible man mm. um but yeah he's he's definitely been a role model in that space for me um the, the the kinds of things that he's done behind the scenes, I think um, he doesn't do it for praise. He just does it because he truly believes that um, that there is a greater purpose in life and a greater fulfilment if you can um, give back to other people. Um, there was a time where a, a very good family friend of ours uh, had a son who uh, it, it, he was very, very intelligent, he lived in Kyabram and, and basically... Um, their family couldn't afford the same kind of educational opportunities that that um, we could. And now unbeknownst to his parents, I think at the time originally, he actually filled out an application to become a, a boarder at Xavier. And of course, as um, as life would have it, he was awarded the scholarship. Um, but it was only a half scholarship. 
And so uh, he he said to his parents, I've won the scholarship. And they said, well, we can't afford the other half. And this is sort of partly um, instructive, you know, into, you know, my sense of, of giving back and what was modelled to me. Um, it was that my dad and another um, friend of his in the town, another, you know, senior professional uh, who had also been educated at Xavier, they got together, each of them had six children, um, who, each of whom were going to educate all of their children at private schools. So it was no um, mean feat that um, this boy was older than each of those men children. Uh -huh. So they were making a decision together to do this before they had even spent a single cent on each of their children's education. But they decided that there was no way that they would allow him to pass up the opportunity for a Xavier education. So they paid 25% each and obviously the scholarship paid the other 50% and he went all the way through uh, Xavier, um, graduated with incredible marks, went on to Melbourne University, became a lawyer, is now a barrister um, and his, his sister is Still my best friend, um, and I, I I do feel that um, that when when you have I mean, that is that is a deep commitment mm. to, to other people. That is more than I'll lend you a glass of you know a cup of sugar or yeah. uh, I'll babysit your kids on Friday. It's 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 more than that. Um, more recently, Dad and I both were introduced to uh, a family from Ukraine who um, who had come to Australia and they were living with. Um, with a, a friend, um, but that was unsustainable. A, a family of four um, suddenly had just arrived and, you know, we're, we're occupying a family home of, of someone we knew. And so Dad and I took it upon ourselves to to help them. And I think that um, what Dad has done is spent countless hours at Centrelink and at the Ukrainian Refugee Association and, um, you know, government departments working out visas and, and you know, leaning on people we know to help. Um, I set them up um, with um, some contacts to it to originally be, be able to, once they had their visas, to be able to work um, as cleaners in people's homes locally. And then we found them at accommodation. They're now, I mean, they're our friends. They are incredible people. Yeah. Got the little girl into school um, just at the end of our street. And um, I think even helping, when you help one person and you can tangibly see the impact yeah. of that assistance, um, it is uh, it, it is incredibly rewarding, and, um, and you know, so doing things at scale, you know, helping um, on on a board, um, you know, like the Murdoch, it definitely has its own rich reward. But I think for me, the the ability to see that immediate, tangible impact um, of one life helping another, um, and and I got that that same sense when you know, helping Will and, and the Murray family at that time. Um, it was, you know, it's it's deeply, deeply rewarding. And and so to back to the question of, you know, um <laughs> you know, what motivates me I yeah. to, to be like this. I, I don't I really honestly don't think I have a choice. I think it's just part of who I am. And and yeah. then how can you not Yeah, how want, can you not? Yeah. How can you not want to feel like that? Like it's a great feeling. Yeah. It's a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing it. I, I feel really moved, especially I think, you know, hearing it about your dad and like just you said earlier about how, um, you know, just simply being someone for someone else like that, that. I'm not sure if that was quite the words you used, but at the heart of it that you're here for other people, you know, like what that actually – and then to, you know, as a principal, but then to actually have lived a life as both you and, and your father and, you know, and other people and you have done, but, you know, just to fo zooming in on, on you guys, like, I mean, to have that and to uh, have it as a principal then to actually apply it in life and then to hear the stories about the, you know, the impact is is really moving. And, I mean, my question, my other question around was how do we connect to our kids? But, I mean, it, boy, you're listening to this now, like it's, I mean, a big part of it is, I think it's part of the process and the rhythm, you know, from what you've said, it's just what the expectation is. But I think also, you know, hearing these stories, you know, about the differences that we can make, you know, when we extend helping hands to other people, you know, what that can mean, whether it's something, it's at an ongoing level and an ongoing commitment, you know, at a system level, like, you know, being on a board or whether it's, 
you know, just something as simple as, as the everyday ways in which we are to those that, that have needs that we can easily see that are in front of us and around us all the time. Oh, absolutely. I think that that point you make about visibility is really critical. Um, and that it doesn't need to be um, institutionalised volunteering or, um, you know, at, at, a, at a really high sort of board level. I think um, my children have had enormous value, have got in, uh, so much out of their sporting achievements and their, their sporting life because both my husband and I have been so involved in um, in just the team structure. Mm. If that's the team manager. I think there was at one point there I was managing five teams at the same time. Um, and, you know, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. Um, but, you know, my husband as well, you know, he, he would always say, let's do it together and, and, you know, make sure that, that our kids are seeing both of us um, give back in, in that way. And um, it's, it's just meant that we've been so connected. And for our kids, I think um, when there's role modelling and when there's visibility, it is really hard to not then see that as just an expectation of, of mm. what a good person is like. And, mm. um, um, but, you know, deep down that, that there are huge personal benefits that come from giving back and and that's what I was saying before you know I, I think there's a, a deep sense of purpose when there's something that is bigger than you in in the world that that you you live in um and you know at a, at a really just tangible level there's I, I've met so many people I've got friendships that have come from all of this work yeah. I've, I've had um you know I think this definitely improved my my social skills, my professional skills, my self esteem. I mm. think at times, you know, if you're ever feeling, you know, not quite right, not quite worthy, you know, you're not having a great day, you can actually just um, reflect on this kind of work and, and say, you know what, I'm okay. This is okay. And you know, I think, you know, from from a young person's perspective, if if you're also just looking at your own job prospects or, you know. Your CV, mm. it certainly doesn't hurt to consider volunteering as um, as a, a stepping stone to um, broadening out your not just your skill set but your your willingness to be involved. Because I think it says a lot about an individual who's prepared to do something um, that isn't necessarily that one track, single minded. Um, I want to do this job, so I've just got to do everything about that job. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it says a lot about people that um, have been um, willing and able to roll their sleeves up and, and do something that just might be good for other people. Yeah, yeah, and out of their comfort zone and, and what that requires yeah. Yeah. of us. I mean, it almost takes us back to the dinner table and the conversation about, you know, getting them out of their the, – the search bubbles and, the you know, the online stuff and, you know, all of that as well as a bit of an, an antidote um, ar around that. So we're kind of we're kind of in the area of parenting, you know. Really, we've managed this really well. <laughs> Go us <laughs> in terms of the um, yeah, you know, the things I'd hope to chat to you about, and um, you know, some of the discoveries we make as parents, and you know, some of the things you've been sharing. You know, really, I think in taking a an active role, you know, being alongside, being someone who's doing things. Um, you've shared a bit about you know influences on your own parenting and parenting styles and you know I don't know that anyone's really can ever be a parenting expert one of the things that I, I think is tricky about parenting can be a bit about sort of the boundary stuff and it comes up a lot you know I'm conscious you know at the time we're recording you know we're we're headed back into the Australian school year you know after summer and you know as every year our kids are getting that little bit older and usually particularly, you know, down south over summer, they're pushing the boundaries and, you know, they're kind of, you know, <laughs> moving things along. I mean, what, what's your what, what's your approach to, you know, setting healthy boundaries, you know, particularly, again, not, not just for boys, but, you know, with the subject of this podcast. I mean, how, how do you sort of go about that, you know, with, with your with your children? Like, what's your approach? What have you learned? What works? What maybe doesn't work? Just well, as I should a, as a preface mom. this by saying that um, my husband and I don't always agree on the boundaries. <laughs> okay. He's probably, um, he is definitely a lot more rigid with his boundary setting right. and consistent. I would be probably accused of being less consistent. Um, <laughs> however, in saying that, my approach 
but because I left home so young, I was 11, I had to find my own way in the world yeah. and I had to push the boundaries that were, you know, that were there, the school rules or whatever else. But I was given a lot of freedom mm. to kind of work it out for myself. And so I sit somewhere in this um, space where I, especially because my, my son's nearly 16 and my daughter's 14 and a half, I kind of feel like they're, they're on the precipice of adulthood. They're not quite there yet. They definitely still need guidance. But I feel that it's, the time is now to give them that incremental responsibility to build trust and to demonstrate respect for their, you know, their right to to have a, a voice in the setting of the boundary. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's often conflict around bedtime. There's conflict around doing homework. There's conflict around time on test. It's pretty standard stuff in most households, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but I think the way that I approach it is more, look, I was thinking it would be, you know, as we approach the term, getting back into the term, let's, you know, have a chat about bedtime. What do you want to do? What time do you want to get up? What, you know, is every day going to be the same? Do you want, and, and have a conversation because, you know, my son was just out of the blue the other day, just declared that he doesn't want to get up late and be racing out the door anymore. He's declared that he wants to get up early. Now we'll see if that works. But <laughs> um, he then recognised that if he's going to get up early, then he's going to have to go to bed earlier. Yeah. And he has already told me that he's going to go to bed about an hour earlier this year than he did last year. Okay. And, um, you know, he, we came to that uh, through discussion. There wasn't, there wasn't a demand. It wasn't um, a declaration, a parental declaration of, right, now you're in year 10, this is the status quo, this is what's happening. It was a conversation. So, as I said, I think if we, if we do come to an agreement, whatever that is, I think, you know, then it's about making sure that we all live by that standard so that, yeah. you know, if he says he's going to bed at a certain time, that we sort of say, come on, mate, well, you made this. You've got more skin in the game. This is what you wanted. So hand over your tech and hop into bed and turn the lights out. Yeah. So, but yeah, I think negotiation more than demand is, is my approach. Um, and the other thing I, I spend a lot of time doing, clearly I like talking, is, <laughs> you know, just taking the pulse of the other parents around me. And I've got a really broad church of girlfriends who have kids, some of whom are slightly older, they've sort of been there, done that, some of whom are, are right in the sweet spot with me, you know, school mums, my mother's group mums, people I can just sort of say, hey, can I ask what's everyone else doing over school holidays with tech time or, you know, um, and, and being able to then just sort of sense check where we're at. And what I found in doing that is, um, you know, probably not surprisingly, there is no hard and fast rule. There's no mm. right way of doing things. There's no way that um, a decision that you make as a parent today to do it to do it one way is necessarily going to improve, you know, your child beyond measure or or um, destroy them beyond measure either. I think that um, every family finds its own balance, and um, they often will do that in response to that own individual child's needs. So I t I try not to be swayed too much by the status quo, and certainly where I don't agree with it. So if everyone's allowed to go to the party or everyone's allowed to drink alcohol or I won't necessarily be swayed by that but um but at the same time I'll be I'll be mindful that that's you know the way that my children are perceiving the world they live in and, start, and use it to start a conversation and and generally speaking I'll be able to find a, you know at least a handful of mums will be doing it my way as well <laughs> I can definitely prove that it's not ever everyone <laughs> yeah, that's right. when they turn around and say oh but everyone's like no they're yeah, not no, no I've got yeah. on good authority <laughs> Love it. Yep. If you could tell a story to a 14-year-old boy and he'd listen to your story, what would the story be? So I thought, I thought about this because I think the story that I would tell a 14-year-old boy would have to be a story about a 14-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And probably the, the message that I would want to get across is a, a message about opportunity and making the most of every opportunity. I, I, I personally don't believe in, in luck. I believe in good fortune, but I think we make our own luck. Mm. Um, I read a quote the other day that said 10% of life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how, how you choose to respond to it. 
Yeah. And um, so the story that I would tell is the story um, of a young boy called Tom. And uh, it was late 1920s in regional Victoria and the depression was looming and um, Tom had grown up on a farm. He'd had to ride a horse uh, to school every day or and it was kilometres to school. Um, and, um, and, and, and he lived with his siblings and his parents um, and they were, they were quite, I think, quite wealthy um, at the time, certainly wealthy enough that, that when uh, some neighbours started to feel a bit of a run on their, their money in the early days of the Depression, um, Tom's father went guarantor on a lot of the bank loans for his friends. And, uh, of course, what happened was that the family lost their farm and they had to move into a, a neighbouring small town. And you can imagine through the eyes of 14 year old boy life would have changed pretty prof profoundly in that time and um, possibly you know some of the opportunities that he may have um, otherwise received in life he possibly felt he wasn't really now going to be capable of achieving so Tom one day saw an ad in the Catholic newspaper the advocate and that had the opportunity to go to boarding school at Xavier College so he thought I'm going to apply so he did and his dad came out to him one, one afternoon, several months later, and said, oh, Tom, there's a letter for you. And so they were reading it together, and um, he realised that he'd been offered a scholarship. And his dad said to him, he said, very earnestly, may you never have to tend the fields again. And that was my grandfather. He went on to graduate uh, from Xavier, and then he became... Uh, a lawyer, I think I said that earlier. Um, ultimately, his studies um, were interrupted by World War II and he persevered and he, he after being in Melbourne and, and studying, uh, moved back to Kyabram and, and built the practice there, which is where he obviously worked with my father and, you know, the two of them built their practice together. But I think the, the reason that story um, resonates with me and I hope it would resonate with other 14 year old boys is that life throws you challenges and uh, it's what you make of the circumstance before you that is the makings of the man it's not what happens to you life mm. doesn't happen to you. you you get a choice in every moment you know we didn't talk about sliding doors but in every moment there is um, more than one path um, there's no roadmap none of us you know, a hand the charter when we're born, saying this is where we're headed. And I think, you know, if you can, you can at times like Tom did, make make some of your own luck. You know, seek out the things that are important to you, like a good education, and then see what happens. And don't necessarily just resign yourself to the fact that because something has happened in this instance, that it is then going to change the course of your life forever. And certainly for me, I have tried as hard as I can, especially professionally, to make my own luck so that my world suits me. And uh, and that's why I find myself in a really professionally fulfilling role. But I work a four day week and um, I live and work in Melbourne, even though my role is national and our head office is in Sydney. And I'm able to be a very, I hope, a very present parent uh, as a result of making some of the choices that I've made in those sliding doors moments to possibly not keep climbing up the ladder for the ladder's sake mm. uh, and to be happy with, with the rung that, that I've chosen to, to stand on because it's where I want to be. That's my story. <laughs> it's beautiful, beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing it. My last question is, what is it to be a good man these days? Mm, I know. So I, I, I kind of come back to I don't think that um, what it is to be a good man or a good person has changed dramatically dramatically through the ages you know I, I think that many of the traits that I hold dear um, in a good man are, are ageless and um, things like to be fair to be honest uh, to be trustworthy to be present um, and you know one of the, the greatest gifts I think my husband has given me you know in our partnership is the freedom uh, to choose how much I wanted to work um, and that um, you know to enable me to devote as much time to, to outside interest into our family as it did to my career 
um, it, it enabled me to sort of step off the treadmill and make some considered choices about um, the time that I wanted to spend um, in, in professional working life and the time that I wanted to spend at home. Um, and I think that, that that to me is a hallmark of that, that deep respect that we've been talking about um, in understanding that, um, you know, to, to be a, a, a good man or a good person is to truly try to understand someone else's need and, and to meet them um, in that place that, that works for them. So um, respect is probably the one word that to me sums up what it is to be a good person, to respect others, to respect yourself and, um, yeah, and just to, to generally, um, yeah, be respectful of, of, of those in the world around you. Genevieve Bramwell, thank you so much for your time. For me personally, I really, I felt very moved in lots of the things you shared. So I really appreciate, you know, your warmth and your your authenticity, you know, in, in what you shared. I think from all of us at Understanding Boys and our listeners, you know, we're really grateful for your time, for your insights and for the work that you do and, and for the model that I guess you give all of us to, to be inspired to, you know, try and live lives, you know, where we consider how we might be of service to others. So again, thanks for your time today. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. We hope you've enjoyed this Understanding Boys podcast. Make sure you subscribe on your podcast app and please leave us a review to help grow the community. For more information about the podcast, please visit understandingboys.com.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.